We're going to take a quick break and talk about Drizzly. Drizzly is fantastic. It's the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep. And get this, under 60 minutes. It's insane. Yeah, I think what's also great is you can compare prices and shop different places and get your best deal. And you know, you're you're shopping and you're doing a lot of cooking during the holiday season and you're all busy and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I need that bottle of wine. Wrapping presents and you don't want to have to take time to run to the store. Or you forget a gift yeah. and you need it delivered real quickly. Here's the way to do it. You download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And Drizzly is giving every new customer $5 off their first order. What's that promo code, Seton? Fast5 at checkout. F-A-S-T-5 at checkout. It's drizzly.com. Parent, volunteer, employee. With your different roles and busy schedule, how can you find time to complete the degree you once started? Cornerstone University's programs are designed for busy adults like you. Take one course at a time, back-to-back to to move through your degree quickly. Attend through an on-campus, live stream, or 100% online format, whichever works best for you. If you're ready to go further in your goals, we're here to make it possible. Achieve without ceasing. Learn more at adult.cornerstone.edu. Hi, it's Matt Harris, uh, host of this podcast, and so happy for the support. I want to let you know that I use Anchor, and you too can use Anchor and make your podcast. You record and edit right from your phone or computer when you use Anchor, and you can even add any song from Spotify. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Thank you for your support. It's been great. We've had a call or two from television shows asking us to take part in that. It's because of your great response. Much appreciated. Feel free to chime in at any point. You can get a hold of me, Matt Harris, at mattharris1028 at gmail.com. And co-host Seton Tucker, that's S-E-T-O-N Tucker on Facebook. Today we're going to be talking about in this episode the fatal boat crash that killed Mallory Beach. We have audio from the dashboard cam of the Buford Sheriff's Department. I think you'll find very interesting. And we will talk about the South Carolina DNR reports and documents that we received. But before we get started, Seton Tucker, explain how... You became fascinated with this case. Well, back, I actually became interested in the case when I saw just social media posts hoping that this young girl was found alive and she was missing. So immediately you were struck. She's just such a beautiful young girl. You're talking about Mallory Beach. Yes, Mallory Beach. 2019. So that's kind of how I first became involved and then just dove deeper into learning more about the family. There were a bunch of articles. There was a great one in the state paper. And finding out, and actually this week I was talking to some, I had a question, did you know who the Murdoch family was before this occurred? And I said, you know, I didn't, but I didn't run in legal circles. So I reached out to a couple of friends who were lawyers and I'm like, did, did you know this family? And they all said yes. So Right. In that I, area and some, even in all no, of South Carolina. I think in all of South Carolina, if you're a lawyer, you probably know who the family was. And you grew up in uh, Hilton Head. Uh, which is Beaufort County, which is where the accident occurred. But Hampton and Hilton Head are, are different. And even though it's relatively close, it's not like you would know people from uh, Hampton or, no, or know these kids who went to school there or anything. It's worlds away in probably every aspect. It's it's a very rural community, um, Hampton. not af- Hampton, and it's not affluent. And, you know, there's a lot of tourist money that runs through Hilton Head. So it's just a world apart, even geographically close, just very different. So that's how you became involved uh, even before the double homicide of Paul Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch. You had reached out to Stephen Smith's mother and you had a kind of a text relationship. Right. I, I had seen rumors that the, that this case may somehow be tied to the Murdoch family. And so I just reached out to her and uh, just became really fascinated with that case because, as we talked about in the previous episode, there was really nothing other than 
one pathologist saying that it was an auto accident, a hit, no and, one, run. A hit yeah. and run. No one else, in, including the lead investigator, Proctor, believed that. So then, then, then there is a, not in the actual accident, but the Murdochs were friendly with Stephen Smith or knew Stephen Smith, I should say. I think that one of their family members, maybe the dad or uncle, was a coach of his yes. for baseball. Yes, there was a connection. When they were there. younger. You, you can listen to the Stephen Smith episode, but that that's why the tie-in with the Murdochs and then the Murdoch uh, double homicide happens. You see my wife out and you're like, hey, I, I, I got all this stuff, I'm really into it, because it really broke open with the double homicide. And then we got together. kind of to felt like time. I was behind the eight ball and your wife said, no, Matt's been wanting to do this true crime podcast. So <laughs> it just kind of all fell into place. And that's uh, where we stand now. So that background is what some of you had asked to hear again. So we have updated that. Now, there are not any huge updates on, on the homicides. We are seven weeks, I believe, something like seven, eight weeks uh, from the time of the double homicide. We have a 911 call that was released that the father of Paul Murdoch, Alec, uh, was on, and we're going to get to that in another episode. So that's coming up. So let's go back to the boating accident that killed Mallory Beach. And we go back to this because we, for one, we've gotten the, the reports finally through Freedom of Information Act and have gone over hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents from the uh, South Carolina DNR and they have responded to something we talked about in a previous episode, which was this that came from Connor Cook's attorneys, correct? Uh, basically saying Brock, Pritcher, Kenner, Camlin, and Crap. These are various law enforcement uh, officers, officers who responded from different agencies. Uh, may have information as to a quote campaign to cloud the investigatory issues and disseminate false information in the community with the intention of misleading law enforcement and prosecution charging parties and the public into wrongly and falsely believing Connor Cook should be arrested and charged as a boat operator with multiple counts of felony boating under the influence, the filing reads. So Paul Murdoch, who was murdered, was charged with boating under the influence. He was about to have his court date, I think, three days after the murders happened. Uh, but he was charged. He was indicted on driving the boat. But this, which is like a pre-lawsuit lawsuit, where they get discovery and they find out whether they have a, a case or not, is saying that there was a campaign to cloud the investigation. Right. And they, either that these people were in on it that are mentioned or they knew about it. Now, that leads us to the response. Yes. Yeah, so South Carolina... Department of Natural Resources um, responded in a statement, and they say that there were never any charges brought against Connor D Cook. And to date, Mr. Cook has not provided law enforcement with a statement about who was operating the boat on February 24th, 19, 2019, despite numerous requests and opportunities to do so. So, I mean, that that's a pretty strong statement, in my opinion, that they're right, they're saying that Connor, and we looked through it, we could not find anywhere where Connor said uh, who was driving the boat. Right, he was immediately shut down, and I don't know if that shut was... Down. He was shut down as far as talking to investigators. Right. Yes, like he said, I'm not going to give any more statements, I'm not going to have any more to say. Right, and so also, they one thing we had questioned about the sobriety, the field sobriety tests, another thing that South Carolina DNR says is that by the time the first DNR officer arrived on the scene, who was, who was Officer Pritchard, all the occupants of the boat, except for Anthony Cook and Mallory Beach, had been transported to Buford Memorial Hospital. There was no opportunity for DNR to administer field sobriety tests in this case. So they, by the time DNR got there, they, they weren't. Other law enforcement agencies could have, but, but they, they weren't able to. And they, 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 there was blood drawn, as we know, now, uh, and that was tested and showed that Paul was way over the legal limit. Right, and they did apply. There's there's affidavits and a search warrant where they they did try to preserve that information, and we we they released what Paul's blood alcohol level was. So some of the public outcry, they actually did obtain the information. So they have the yeah, and we don't know what Connor's blood alcohol level is because they don't need to know it because they're not accusing him of driving. Right. But so, they, I think they, they, they did preserve that. It just wasn't 
Yes, they, we, yeah, we don't know what it was because they, why would they even have to look it up if they don't think that Connor, Connor was never indicted on charging? Right. Uh, on, on driving, I'm sorry. And they also say it is important to note that in a serious accident where there are potentially, where there may potentially be serious and non visible or internal indis- injuries, field sobriety tests may not be utilized or will delay until the suspect is cleared by medical personnel. So, I mean, we talked about that in another episode is, mm-hmm. you know, were they just trying to make sure they get these kids to the scene? To, yeah, to the hospital. And they're saying their first priority was that, to get them to the hospital before they give the blood alcohol field sobriety test, which makes sense if someone's hurt, they have need to be taken care of, or mice also affect them walking a straight line or whatever the case may be, or have a head injury that may uh, cause them to not pass the test. But we I mean, are pretty you darn have sure to... that they were all... And drinking t- pretty heavily. Yes, but, it, I mean, their first priority is probably to make sure that people get the medical attention that they need. So, Seton, let's begin with the things that we've dug through on South Carolina Department of Natural Resources documents and pages and pages of documents, I should say. Uh, and we'll go boater by boater. And I want to point out one thing before we get started on that is in the, the people that have been deposed uh, by Connor Cook's attorneys— their reports are in there. There's Michael Brock, who was with uh, uh, DNR. Austin Pritchard was with DNR. Their reports are on this, uh, just to point that out. Now, Michael Brock is now with SLED in an alcohol control unit, but their reports are part of the reports in this podcast that we're about to do. So let's go. Which, uh, which uh, boater do you want to begin with? Well, before we start, I think we need to also mention that there are allegations, and we know that there are connections between some of the officers, Pritchard and Brock, both had connections to the Murdoch family. So we talked about this in a previous episode, yes. so definitely go back and listen, because I listen think that, that's yes. important to consider when looking at the reports. Right. And we're taking a little break to talk about something we have fallen in love with, which is Green Chef. Seton, you just told me you're ready to go order some more, and so am I. Yes, I love it. There's so many, definitely, choices, and everything is pre-portioned, easy to follow. It makes cooking really simple, especially for a weeknight. Yeah, we're so busy, everybody, running around doing their things with kids and whatnot. So you just get the Green Chef out. It's one little bag. You're good to go. It's America's number one meal kit for eating well, meaning the best meal kit, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just want to eat more balanced meals, this is the way to go. And the, and the family loved them? They love them, and I don't have to go to the grocery store. That's right. That is a big thing. They come right, and you don't have to worry about missing an ingredient. Go to greenchef.com slash Murdoch10 and use code Murdoch10, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H-10, to get 10 free meals, including free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. I'm going to pause for a moment and talk about Warby Parker. I've used Warby Parker for glasses for a couple of years now, so I'm so happy they're signing on as a sponsor for the podcast. And Seton, I know you love the try. Yes, this is the first time I tried Warby Parker, and I ordered my five pairs for free. And you have five days to try them on. There's no obligation to buy, and they ship for free. And they include a prepaid return label. and. I love the selection. I found out I have a wide face. Um, <laughs> and I the Daisy Wides were the ones that worked nice. best for me. And my husband complimented me on them, which is not like him to notice my <laughs> granny readers. And the glasses start at 95 bucks, including prescription lenses. Don't let your FSA or HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use on Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Murdoch. That's warbyparker.com slash M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. So let's start with Connor Cook. I have a report from the evening of February 24th. The officer was Cook. And in that statement, he says, we were headed down Archer's Creek, heading towards Broad River. I remember seeing the bridge and that was about it. I don't know that Cook is related to the cooks that were on the boat. I know that you'll hear audio later, and part of that audio is when Anthony Cook is talking to one of the Buford County sheriffs and says that his mom works for SLED. I haven't confirmed that, but it is mentioned in that. I just want to point that out. Now, Pritchard, Austin Pritchard, 
he is the first DNR guy on scene. Around 3.30 he arrived. He says in his report that Beaufort County Sheriff's Department, Port Royal Police, and multiple Marine MPs were there. And his description of Connor Cook and what Connor Cook said, by the way, he wrote this report on the 28th, which four days after the accident. He said uh, about Connor, Connor said, quote, I don't remember anything but hitting the bridge. So very similar to what the other Cook had reported. Right. And then we also have something. So there's a report from David Rafesco, who was actually with the Beaufort Water and Search Rescue. Yeah, first mate, I believe. Yes. And he was attempted to contact Connor because they wanted to get more information about the accident, like what direction they were having in hopes that this would aid them in finding Mallory. So in this report, it says that Connor told him, I was not driving the effing boat. I do not know who was driving the effing boat. You need to talk to my mother. I am in the hospital. So he then reportedly passes the phone to his mother, and she tells him that she has already that he's already given his statement to DNR, and she hung the phone up. Correct. The other mention we have of Connor is by nurse Elizabeth McElhaney, who said she heard Miley say that she braced herself because the pylon was coming, and Connor said he didn't know what happened. We also have, I want to mention one other thing in the DNR reports, is Brock telling Pritcher at about 540 to get field sobriety on Connor, and Connor refused. And also in Brock's statement, he says that Pritchard told him there were two possible drivers, and Pritchard was going to get uh, field sobriety from Connor and Paul. And, but they both refused to give statements or have a field sobriety test, and they were going to get a warrant for a blood test. Okay. Well, they, the other thing is, too, in our last episode, we did talk about Alec had communication at the hospital. Yeah, he was there. With, and he was, I think, trying to shut down communication. Multiple people from the hospital said Alec was trying to orchestrate things. So this could very well be why... Why he didn't talk. He did talk that evening. And again, we don't... We, you can go back and listen to that episode, but we don't... Necess- we're not uh, uh, telling you that Alec was doing some nefarious thing here. He might have been possibly trying to protect the kids. We don't know. I don't want to... I don't want to guess at intent. No, uh, we but, don't know. Uh, but, uh, but, but he but, was very clearly talking to them, and that would, it would add up. It makes sense that Connor's not making a statement because an attorney's there saying don't make a statement. Let's move to Paul Murdoch's ex, Morgan Doherty. Let's begin with, I guess we begin with the visit from uh, Austin Pritcher, the DNR agent. Yes. So he, in his report, which was from the evening of the accident, uh, says when he asked her about what happened, she said they were at a party at Palkey Island with friends. They left the party and went downtown to Luther's where Connor and Paul went inside because they were the only ones with their IDs. They left downtown and was heading home, and Connor was driving because Paul was too drunk to drive. We hit the bridge and rode up on some rocks. Mallory was nowhere to be found. Okay, so she says Connor was driving, but it might be, you could read that as unclear as if he was driving at the time of the accident. She does say he was driving when they leave the dock, although that's disputed in other counts. So continue. Yeah, and it's 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 definitely, there does seem to be confusion about who was driving, whether officers or people, but there was... At least in the report, it says that. Right. It's also interesting to note that in his report, he says that she says, I don't want anyone to hear what I'm going to say. And at that point, she's implicating Connor. Yes. So it is a bit confusing what's happening there. And then it gets a little bit more confusing. At 7 a.m., Michael Brock and Austin Pritchard from DNR go to the hospital at 7 a.m. They say Morgan was walking out. And this is from Brock's statement. Morgan was walking out and she said she thought Connor was driving, but she was assuming it. We also have to note that Brock also has connections to the Murdoch family. Correct. And you can go back and hear those connections in the one of the previous episodes. So continue with what else we see or read about Morgan in the documents from DNR. Okay, so she, in a statement on February 25th, which was the day after, she said, I put my face in a blanket for the ride for the rest of the ride. I was assuming he was driving, but the boat manner was different from what Connor from when Connor was driving. So she's kind of 
backing off her statement that Connor was driving the boat, and she starts saying that she's not sure. She's not sure who was driving, but and the, she. But the boat seemed to be more uh, reckless. Is the implication right? And she's she asked to rewrite her statement. Yes, and in that statement on the twenty fifth, where she's speaking to Pritchard, she says, "I have the strangest feeling Paul was driving." Today, Monday morning, I texted Austin, and he allowed me to rewrite the statement now that my head was on right. Wow. And he says, Austin, that's Austin Pritchard, who we talked about earlier from DNR. And, you know, that's all possible. Things were, I mean, these kids had to be in incredible distress right. as this happened. And I must add that in her written statement on the 24th, she wrote that she was under the blanket. And it was sad. When you read the statement, she says... My friend, my best friend, capital letters, is missing. She's gone. That was her written statement. So she was under the blanket uh, when that happened. So. Well, she, we can't conclusively, if her head was under the blanket, she can't totally say for sure who was driving. But she does say in her statement to Young that. And he had, he had pulled her out of the crowd the next day, like 530 or something, as they were gathered still hoping to find Mallory Beach. When she just describes when Paul was driving the boat, she was very scared. And so when the accident occurred, the boat was being operated very carelessly again. So that's why she's thinking Paul was the driver. Where she thought about it, she decided on that. And also uh, we have Morgan saying that she had a blanket over her head again. That is reported by, or in the statement of, one of the nurses. Right. So, well, and in the nurse, Moreno, who was an RN, she states that she heard one of the girls yell out a male's name just before the boat crash. And because of that, Morgan assumed that he was driving the boat. Who's but then the later, I think that was that would be Connor. So that's what she's saying, that she thought Connor was driving the boat, but she recanted that in her statement to the officer. And she requested that Mr. Murdoch not be allowed in her room. Also, we are wondering why none of these interviews were recorded. Now, there is word that an Anthony Cook recorded interview existed, but that is now missing. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's that's what I see right now. So that is what is accused in the previous episode. You can talk about the lawsuit from Anthony Cook's people. There would be no questions about the reports if there are audio recordings of this. I mean, I get... They ran into some of them. They talked to her as she was leaving the hospital. Maybe it was a brief conversation. They didn't have the opportunity to record it. But it does seem a little bit unusual that there were no recorded interviews. Now let's move to Paul Murdoch, who was indicted on three charges of voting under the influence and then was murdered uh, about two months ago. What do we have in the DNR reports about Paul Murdoch? Well, not much because his parents came to, or his father and grandfather came to the hospital and shut down any communication. So he really never gave a statement. You can go back and listen to the previous episode about the reports that came out of hospital personnel that were reported in the DNR files and Buford County Sheriff's Department files about what the hospital staff said about Paul's behavior and things that they heard Paul uh, say or overheard Paul say. So... What do you have for us now on Paul Well, Murdoch? we do have some audio from the scene, the accident scene, and that was, you know, prior to his father and grandfather becoming involved. So we do have some recordings that we'd like to listen to now. This is from the Buford County Sheriff's Dash Cam. Can I use your phone? Hey, bro, I ain't got my phone on me, brother. You, you ain't got your phone on you? No, you dropped yours in the grass right back there. So you can hear the officer telling Paul where he had dropped his phone. And I know that was some of the missing evidence was also Paul's phone. So we we, we know that Paul's phone was definitely there the night at, of the at accident. At one point, yes. At one point, yes. it was there. Okay. And I also want to point out that when we listen to the dash cam audio, it is disturbing. The kids are so, I say kids, young adults, whatever, they are so obviously upset. And there's crying. And in the 911 call, which is an earlier episode too from the night, and it's it's a very upsetting scene, and you can hear in we won't play all of it, but in Anthony's uh, discussion 
on the dash cam, he is, it, you just feel just awful uh, listening to him talk to the officer. So let's get into the reports on Anthony, the audio, the DNR reports, etc. Well, I think we should listen to a clip of Anthony yelling at Paul at the scene. It's really emotional. It's very explicit. So Yes, very explicit. So if you have kitties in the car, turn it down for 30 seconds. We might want to put out also that it, we edited it for time restraints. Uh, but here is from Buford County Sheriff's Department dash cam, Anthony Cook yelling at Paul Murdoch. We're on the main road. You won't miss us. Get that motherfucker right there away from me. Bro, <laughs> you fucking smiling like it's fucking funny. Sit down. Sit down. My fucking girlfriend gone, bro. Sit down. You think it's fucking funny? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Hope he's right. Fucking hell. Very, very upsetting to hear that and the anger and the sadness that was going on. We have more clips from that same dash cam. Which one do you want to hear next? So I want to talk about he, the officer in the car who was trying to calm him down was asking him about who was driving. So let's play that clip to see what he tells the officer. Hey, Keith. The driver is the one with no clothes on, correct? Be honest with you. The one you were getting mad at back there, he had he was in his drawers. He was the last one driving whenever I got down in the floor to put the boat head on the box. Yes, sir. And so there he's saying Paul was driving, last he knew. He got down to the bottom of the boat with his girlfriend. Yeah, he definitely uh, believed Paul was the driver, but I don't know if that's a hundred percent. And that takes us to another clip. Right. Let's listen to this next one where he tells the officer a little bit more about what happened leading up to the crash. And that's when he was going way too fast. So I don't even know. I finally got to the point I grabbed my girlfriend and put her in my lap in the bottom of the boat and was holding on with my eyes closed. The next thing I know, I'm in the fucking water and I can't find it, man. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very sad, very disturbing. And I think that playing it just gives you an idea of what was going on at the scene. And I just feel bad for all involved. It's a terrible, as a, as a parent, you hit that, hear that and you just start to cry. All right, take a break for a moment. Talk about a new concept in glasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. I'm talking about Warby Parker. I've been using them even before they signed on with us. Love the free home try-on program. It's awesome. Yes, this is the first time I've tried Warby Parker, and you get to order five pairs of glasses, try them for free for five days, and there's no obligation to buy. They ship for free, including a prepaid return shipping label. Yes, and I took the quiz, and I found out I needed wide. Mm. They have everything from extra narrow to extra wide. Yes, and the quiz helps you, and the selection, amazing. Uh, When I show people the Warby Parker app that allows you to do a virtual try-on, they're blown away. Remember, don't let your FSA and HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use in Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. Try five pair of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Murdoch. That's warbyparker.com slash Murdoch, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. It's not too late to make someone's holiday season a special one. Start now as an Amazon delivery station warehouse associate to earn some extra money for the holidays. You'd help bring joy to thousands near you by preparing packages and loading them up for their final delivery. With night and early morning shifts available through the new year, you'd also have the flexibility to spend time with your loved ones. To start as a delivery station associate, go to Amazon.com slash holiday work. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. So let's just check out the uh, reports of DNR in regards to uh, Cook, uh, who stayed at the scene, did not go to the hospital because he was distraught and wanted to be there in case Mallory was found. So we have a report from Pritchard from that evening, and he says, while walking back to the truck, I stopped and asked Anthony Cook, who was on board the vessel, if he knew who was driving, and he said he did not know. So now we also have a report from Brock, and in this report, Anthony tells him 
that there was an argument and that he and Mallory were, were behind the seat facing the engine. So he says he was facing away. So I think we should now listen to some audio that we have. From the dashboard cam up here for County Sheriff's, we're not sure which, if it's Pritchard or Brock, that Anthony's talking to in this clip, but you can uh, give it a listen. Hey, I'm with Department of Natural Resources. Who was driving the, the boat? Crash out six up. The last time I grabbed my girlfriend and got down in the bottom of the boat, yeah, Paul was driving. Paul was driving? Yes. Yeah. I begged and begged and begged and begged to let me yeah, drive. Hold on a second. Uh-huh. And wh wh where are we all coming from? Palky. Huh? Palky. Palky? Okay. And, and, and Paul was driving, not Connor? If Connor was driving, I'll it happened after I had done flipping. The Italian one with the fire department and the book of the DNR. They were, were both sitting on the front seat. You were, you were laying... Laying in the front, in the bottom, no, the back of the bottom of the boat. Before you hit? Yes. Okay, and Paul and Connor were sitting on right behind the, the console? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I had done fault with both of them for 30 minutes about letting me drive, and both of them thought it was fucking funny. Yeah, okay. All right. We're, we're going we're to do everything we can to find her, okay? And I want to bring up this statement that Brock signed off on from Keith Cook, where he says, one of the, one of the lines in here is, uh, the throttle got slammed by who I don't know, and I fell in the bottom of the boat and took Mallory with me. Next thing I know, I woke up. Now, this one's interesting Keith, because... Keith is Anthony, but I know it says Keith. I think it's Keith Anthony Cook, so oh, yes, that's probably yes. why it says Keith. That's why it is. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yes, Keith Anthony Cook, but it's Anthony's. And one of the interesting things about this statement is it's circled on the bottom of the statement, audio only. Now, this is a uh, perhaps a piece of missing evidence because at this point, no one has this, this alleged tape that was done with Anthony Cook. So on March 1st, we have another report from Hammond, and he tells us that Anthony believed that he had fallen asleep in the back of the boat, and he stated that the sounds of the motor would put him to sleep. So Ham there does seem to be some inconsistencies. Hammond is a DNR. Uh, the accident happened the 24th. That report from DNR was the first seven days later, March 8th, from SLED, Special Agent Chandler Harney. Uh, along with some other investigators, take a statement. Uh, Young called Anthony Cook to find out why Anthony was not coming to the interview. And he put the speaker, a phone call on speakerphone. During that phone conversation, and this is from SLED, during that conversation, Anthony Cook stated that he knows his cousin, Connor Cook, was not driving the boat at the time of the accident. He stated Connor had told him, Anthony, he was not driving the boat at the time of the accident. Anthony also stated... He knows the Murdochs are trying to pin the boating accident on Connor, and he does not think it is fair. He also commented that Connor is very scared of coming forward because of the Murdochs. And he made several comments about the Murdochs being able to get away with things in the past, and that's why he and his cousin do not think anything will happen if Connor talks to law enforcement. He made several comments about not wanting anyone to get in trouble for this. Anthony continues because he said he's a true believer, and it happened for a reason. And it was soon after this, though, that uh, Paul Murdoch was indicted for BUI. Well, we should also talk about that he believes that the Murdochs had gotten away with things in the past because another thing that came up on the dashboard was a talk about a previous accident. So I think we should listen to that clip. You know, about a month ago, a year ago, and her got in a wreck together. That vehicle? Yeah. You know, I thought she was dead. I thought she was 
Oh, and she lived, hmm. dude. She lived. Yeah, definitely disturbing to think that they had a prior near miss before this. And I know that Morgan mentions another accident that she had been involved in to one of the nurses because that we talked about that in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now let's talk about Miley. Miley and her statements. Uh, Miley Altman is Connor's girlfriend, and Connor's attorney is the one who was saying that there might have been some sort of conspiracy to frame Connor. So what do we have from Miley as far as statements go? The first one I find is Austin Pritchard from DNR, who in his statement talks about all the people he talked to, and in there, Miley says she did not know who was driving. What else do we have from Miley in the DNR reports? She is the only one who actually had a recorded interview, which I know when we talked in our last episode, that was kind of unusual. I think it would probably be protocol when we talked to John. Yeah, John Snyder, the DA, XDA. Yes. So as far as a recorded interview, is that what you're saying? She, she's the yes, only one that it. we have a recorded interview, and that seems like that is most likely not protocol. I would love to speak to someone in law enforcement and get some clarification on that. But she also says in a statement to Young that she saw Paul driving with his hand on the wheel. I then asked her how she saw Paul operating the boat, and she described to me that she looked over her shoulder and watched Paul steering the boat. Miss Altman stated that a short time after that, she looked up and she saw the bridge and screamed. She stated that she braced herself and at the impact was knocked down in the seat where she was originally sitting. So she's actually the first person who actually says... Literally says... Paul, she witnessed Paul being the right. driver of the boat. Right, right. That's a big statement. It is the only clear-cut statement. Most people are either saying they aren't positive or just denying, like Connor and Paul both go back and forth denying that they were driving. Neither one accuses the other one. They just say they weren't driving. Right, and she was sitting, reportedly, she was sitting in all of the reports. They Multiple people drew the locations of where they were sitting on mm-hmm. the boat, and she was sitting right in front of the helm in the front of the boat with Morgan, who may or may not have had a blanket over her head comforting her because she had just had an altercation with Paul. And that is a wrap on this episode Again, thank you so much for your support. We have a 911 call coming up in the next episode from the night of the murders. We'll get to that. Thanks again, Seton. We will talk soon. Reach out to Seton Tucker, S-E-T-O-N, Tucker, on Facebook. Uh, Matt Harris, that's me, uh, mattharris1028 at gmail.com. Cancer. So many lives are touched by cancer. In fact, one in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer. At the American Cancer Society, we're on a mission to free the world from cancer. It's a big mission, driven by little things like a ride to treatment, a free place to stay, a 24-7 helpline. But these little things are really the big things because to a cancer patient and their family, they're everything. And every day we reach thousands of cancer patients who so desperately need these services. But we need your help to get these critical services to more people and families in need this holiday season. Go to cancer.org and join the fight against cancer. It takes just minutes to donate and help provide essential support to cancer patients and their families. Don't wait. More than one in three people will be diagnosed with cancer. Go to cancer.org right now and make a difference. Go to cancer.org.